Okay. Oh, yeah, I see levels in the machine. Hey, everybody. Good. <laughs> we are a very professional show. <laughs> we are, and that professional show is called the Motion Design Hotline. I'm Evan Abrams, joined as usual by Kyle Hamrick. How are you doing, Kyle? Uh, I'll say fabulous. Um, okay. It's it's not quite as warm in my office as I would like it to be, mm. um, but, you know, we're uh, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, thriving in the root cellar. It's going to keep all of your <laughs> roots uh, optimal. I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> this is... Motion Design Hotline, uh, it's not where we uh, age tubers. It's where we teach you how to make something about tubes. Help, help me out here, Kyle. What? No, I'm, uh, you're on your own here. <laughs> something, about, something about YouTube and the internet's made of tubes. I don't know. In other words, okay. I'm trying to connect the Well, things. you know what, Evan? You're, you're better at this stuff than I am. <laughs> Yes, good, good, good. Oh, well, let's not potato around the bush. Um, <laughs> we are here to pick up the pick up the leftovers. Uh, we're going to microwave our mashed potatoes here uh, that we didn't get to last week. So last week we were talking about the new sort of GLB imports into After Effects. Mm -hmm. um, but focusing... The entirety of the true 3D workspace. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For that true, true 3D 3D-ness. Uh, mm -hmm. But today we're going to kind of continue that on. So basically last week we were talking about some real, I want to say basic stuff that will be helpful for anyone doing any kind of 3D things. Oh, also, hello. Hello, Yash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yash Lucid. It's not a dream. Here we are. Um, so <laughs> um, today we're going to continue on with sort of like effects that you can layer on over top of things because GLBs and gefolds and whatever... They're not the most high res type of model, the most high textured things. So sometimes they can look a little bit too clean. So we're going to look at some ways to just make the stuff look good. Um, mm -hmm. And if and, uh, effects are literally half the name of the software we're using. So, oh, yeah, um, you know, seem, seems appropriate, right? Yeah, well, the, I mean, the other half is after. So let's we better get to <laughs> it. Uh, so, Kyle, let's start with mine. And hello, Umicorn. Hello, Brooke. Hello, hello. Ah, 15 people are hanging out with us. Yep. Today. That's nice. Waves um, all around. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be here. It's nice to spend a Monday getting into this stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll I'll just kick it over to my screen here. Well, let's start off simple, right? Let's start with the simple stuff, I guess. Um, so if we strip it away to nothing, which you should be observing here, we're in our advanced 3D. I'm going to go into the old renderer options. Oh, no, wait, that's not what I want. I want to go to the oh yeah i gotta go to the uh i want that list where it tells me what's on uh -huh. and what's off <laughs> and, and i feel like we should perhaps give a very quick disclaimer that uh if you did not watch last week's episode and you have not played with this feature yet we are kind of assuming that you have that foundational knowledge so um if we spent the whole time explaining on the fundamentals again we'd just be redoing the last week's show um but if you have questions if there's something that uh you just have no idea what we're talking about Please let us know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get into that. Um, but basically, right, we have the advanced 3D option here in the renderer, the form of 3D we're looking at. Usually, it's probably classic 3D. We're kicking into the advanced 3D. So these things are on. These things are off. These things are hot. These things are not. These things are in. These things are out. Um, this is top 30 under 30. This is bottom 40 over 40. Keep um, going. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, this is the cheers this is the jeers um <laughs> this is the niles this is the fraser uh <laughs> so anyway so what's enabled 3d models and materials yes environment lights and shadows cool physically based rendering of 3d layers Ugh, what does that mean uh so if people are familiar with 3d stuff pbr is the name of the game physically based rendering uh which is basically splitting things off into channels and the light will affect them sort of simulating the way lights are meant to work in the universe that we uh interact with most of the time speak for uh, yourself yeah, yeah exactly sorry <laughs> the universe that some of us interact with some of the time um, and then we've got material overrides on text, shape, bevels, and sides, curved footage layers, so you can bend stuff. But importantly, mm -hmm. what is off? What is out? You can't put effects on any of those beautiful 3D stuff. Motion blur and depth of field are out. 
light transmission is out, shadows from non-environment lights, and except shadows only are out. So that And means... I think it's worth, oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt, I do think it's worth pointing out that this feature is still relatively new, and mm. Adobe has made it clear that this is still in active development. So some of those things that are not currently allowed may change in the future. Right. The the lists are being updated. Yeah. <laughs> Things are changing. Um, oh, also, hello to Martin the Martian. Uh, hello, hello. Oh, and uh, Evans uh, Karangu. Let me know if that's how that's said, uh, and uh, I will uh, attempt to correct myself. I've been doing Duolingo French lessons, so I can oh. get above a second grade level in French these days. <laughs> So I can stop being jeered at when I venture into Quebec. Oh, we'll um, see if we can get you above a second grade level in After Effects someday, too. <laughs> Never. I refuse. <laughs> I went to a Montessori school for After Effects. <laughs> um, so we've got some extruded text, right? Basic stuff. And then we need to start layering things on. So here's some more models. These are the GLBs that are our little things that I sent out of Cinema 4D. Then... Because the black thing behind is not particularly great, I've just got a basic black solid back there with a nice subtle gradient going from kind of a purpley to a, a black. It's causing that vignetting that goes in the center. So that's one way you could put something behind, right? Into the void. So that's one void filling solution. Um, but then we need to put some lights in the space. And this is probably the area where I think a lot of people fall down when they're first getting into 3D. If you really want to just practice 3D stuff, just put a model on a very really basic set and just start moving lights around. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Make that your first priority. Um, so, And honestly, learn a little bit about how lights work in the real world because sure. this is, obviously there are some abstractions that happen when you're working in a virtual space, but it is based on the same ideas. Like right now, I don't know about you, Evan, but I have a light here and a light here and a light behind me. Um, Not me. You know, I just have so... two lights in front of me, so this appears harsh, like I'm being interrogated for my crimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's meant to feel feel purposefully oppressive. <laughs> it's like I'm We're really down. on it today. It's like I'm staring down a Mack truck. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I should probably put a light back there. We'll see. I'm going to redecorate my office this year. So we're going to we're going to work on it. You heard uh, it here first, folks. Yeah, we'll <laughs> stay tuned for the reveal. Um, so here's when we just click one light on. So here you, I've switched into a two view so you can see one point light over here. So it's kind of off axis, right? That way we're if we were to just kind of barrel it right down the front, it doesn't look sort of quite as good as you start to push it off to the side so that we start to get more defined areas of brightness, more defined areas of shadow, as opposed to just sort of a meh evenness, you know, that kind of gray slorp that, that we're not really looking for. What we want is areas of highlight, areas of contrast, so that we can pick out the definitional parts of stuff, right? Have an opinion, geez. Um, <laughs> and then... One light it looks like this. If we snap on a second light, we start to get, and we'll go kind of back and forth between these. You can see that we're starting to get, bing, another light, and it's giving highlight cutting up uh, in behind here. So we're getting, you can kind of see that like the inside of the O is lighting up, right? And the inside of the R is lighting up. So we're getting... We're getting light coming from two directions, and I only put two lights in this whole scene, right? There's only two, we'll say, like, manual lights in here. Um, I guess in this case, we would call them what? This is the key and the rim light, I guess, are are the... Because this one is... Or is that a fill? Anyway. Well, uh, if they're both coming from the front, uh, the one that is uh, lower intensity would typically be called the fill. Right. Well, this one is this one's but, kind of this one's out in front, and the other one is in behind. Okay, uh, so yeah, uh, a rim light is probably the better, yeah, and, better terminology. And like, if you use fewer, more intense lights, you are gonna get a very dramatic feel to it, right? Like, if you just put one parallel light in the scene, that's pretty harsh, right? This is some some real like uh, two tone <laughs> type of deal. 
which is totally fine, right? Like as long as you're being intentional with what you're mm -hmm. crafting with the light. Um, but the third light that I dropped into the scene is an environment light. So in order to discuss the environment light, this is what the environment is that is being basically wrapped around a sphere and being and then projecting inward from that sphere towards everything. So it's kind of like some purpley constellation-y mm -hmm. thing. Um, and with that, we lose, like pretty much all the shadows are done, right? Because there's light coming from every which away direction. It's not particularly evenly happening. And it's, I've, I've gone ahead and actually brought the intensity down on it so that it's not like overpowering, but it's giving some color to the shadows that exist out in the world, right? And just like in our reality, photons are bouncing off of stuff all the time. It's very rare that something is actually in total absolute darkness. Um, so that's just something to kind of be, I guess, aware of is, is that it is rare in the real world for things to have no possibility of any light bouncing on them whatsoever, right? It just, that's just not how we be. Um, you know, although things can feel pretty dark sometimes, so. Can. I, I've been a very dark place, and it's super weird. <laughs> Death, Death Valley with a with no moon. Right. Um, oh, oh yeah. that'd be freaky. It was. Super, <laughs> uh, oddly quiet, too. Right, because there's, there's not even any light pollution out there, right? Like, you're you're right. far enough away from most, most thing. <laughs> but anyway, so that's how I'm creating kind of the specific lighting scenario that's going on out here. Now... On top of that, I have a couple of adjustment layers. Now we can, right, just like we are putting a simple layer behind stuff, we can then put simple adjustment layers in front of stuff. It's the same as if we were putting adjustment layers in front of anything else, right? There's nothing particularly special about, about this idea, but something that can really help is snapping down what's called a camera lens blur. Now I'm gonna just take us, take us back into the singular view here so you can kind of see how this is behaving. I'm just gonna, Maybe I jack this up to like 12 and we'll be able to. Yeah, a little bit of exaggeration is uh, good for a demo here. <laughs> so you can see how much blurrier it is over here than it is over here. The nice pointy sharp part of the g and the and the soft of the of the d over the here. Duh. Yeah, yep. <laughs> the duh. <laughs> see, this is my second grade education kicking in again. <laughs> <laughs> so a camera lens blur you're able to use a blur map to decide where is blur, like where is blurry around here. Um, and so I have a map layer. If we just double click on this and we enjoy all the way down to all of its component parts. Um, it, it's basically a circle. And then I was playing around with like inverting it and stuff like that and, and doing stuff. But if you can create gray values, you could be using a ramp for this. I prefer to use shape layer. The, yeah, shape layers. You could be using anything. As long as it resolves to black and white information, um, that's going to say is blurry here, is not blurry here. I use the circle personally uh, just mm -hmm. because it renders pretty fast and the camera lens blur does not. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. trying to keep the, keep my life a little bit light, <laughs> trying to keep it light and breezy out here. But you're able to define with the circle basically an area of total brightness and areas of total darkness, as opposed to with a gradient, you don't really get that inner threshold, but with a shape layer, right? You can modify the gradient. Mm -hmm. um, I guess and, just, uh, just we'll, we'll get there in a minute, but there's a reason I really like using shape layers, but you have to kind of know one little trick. Mm. <laughs> so that's a teaser for a few minutes from now. Would you say that this is a trick that people don't want you to know about Kyle? <laughs> Yeah, well, that will be our, our bait to get people into our 30-part Twitter thread about mm, mm, mm. whatever this is. <laughs> mm. Cameras don't want you to know this one trick. Um, so that's the idea, though. Now, with something like a camera lens blur, remember, it's blurry out here. It's not blurry in here. This is similar to like a tilt shift type effect mm -hmm. or like a toy camera type deal. So... We're not really having, it's not really depth of field. It's really just vignetting of the focus. Um, but it's still, it makes some things blurry, some things sharp. And because depth of field is off, then this is kind of a nice 
like a, a nice little compromise, right, to bring mm -hmm. out in the thing. Um, then the final kind of effects that I plorped on here are really just a curves adjustment. So if we just kind of toggle that off. Let's, yeah, let's see those curves, Evan. <laughs> Dem curves. So they're pretty subtle, right? I'm really yeah. just, I'm bumping the green down. I'm pushing the blue up. I'm really trying to sort of intensify what colors already exist. And then I'm increasing the contrast slightly. So clipping a bit of the black uh, down here and then pushing up some of the mid-tones uh, to be a little bit brighter. And that's creating a, a bit more of a higher contrast type of deal. It's usually better to start with something that is of low contrast because we can always make it more extreme later. Um, that's why you'll actually see sort of a lot of, a lot of renders that look kind of, hmm, hmm, but then we're going to go ahead and just, we're going to actually composite those the same way you would do to footage, right? That's what we yeah. do to, to footage all the time. So treating 3d stuff the same way just kind of makes sense. We want as much color and luminosity information coming in so that we can manipulate it on the on the going out yeah. uh without having to like re-render it because that would be bad um that would be, that'd be bad and upsetting um but the last little piece on here is a, a widow bit of noise um so if you really zoom in here you can see that i've mm -hmm. i've dropped some noise hls on the on the final image <sighs> there's you can there see that there's like <laughs> some you see some kind of graininess happening, right? But when it looks too clean, it doesn't feel good, right? It, we're in the we're in the uncanny valley of stuff when it's too clean. So sometimes we want to muddy it up. Like this is kind of why our trends have gone towards sort of a, away from things that are that are just they're either intentionally flat, as in there's very little shading going on, or instead of like, oh, this is a blue thing, it's like, it's a blue plastic thing. Like we're intentionally making it look like something. Um, anyway, those are just some thoughts that are just gonna give us a little bit for our brains to hold on to instead of kind of sliding off the smooth surfaces of the images, <laughs> um, which can, I don't know. It, I think if you're diving into a specific aesthetic, right? You just wanna be kind of intentional yeah. about how to control these things now that, that's a great time to talk about kyle i want to talk about specific aesthetics while we're here <laughs> we, we've all got a few people uh hanging out with us but i want to talk about the specific aesthetics of reboot <laughs> the canadian television program mm -hmm. yes um which uh, if anyone is interested in observing reboot on dvd well you should take part in our fun little contest that we're doing uh this month uh mm -hmm. so head on over to motiondesignhotline.com contest details are in there but what we want you to do is download a lot of the files that you're gonna see us playing around and working with, make something with them, and then uh, send it to us on social media. So uh, get, get at us on Instagram, at EC Abrams, at Kylosaurus Rex, uh, tag uh, at Adobe Live, hashtag Motion Design Hotline. That way we'll be able to, we're almost guaranteed to find it. If you do, <laughs> if you if you do those things, and even if you only do some of them, we're definitely <laughs> going to find them. That's kind of why we've backloaded that with too many things mm -hmm. for people to do. Um, people tend to remember about you know a third of the instructions, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. Do that. The winner, <laughs> we will pick a winner uh, at the end of the month. Uh, you've got until like the 26th to, to send us something, and then on the 29th. We're gonna we're gonna look at them uh, on air. We're gonna see what's good, and uh, someone will win some DVDs and a, and a T-shirt. So and a T-shirt, most yeah. importantly. And you know what? I already have um, figured out one or two other little office knickknacks that will also go to this person. <laughs> Kyle, we can do other contests in other months. Nothing is stopping us from doing that. Too late. <laughs> Well, I mean, look, we've I've got a big old box of stuff that I want to get out of my office. So this is the best way to do it is to force other people to have my stuff. Um, <laughs> speaking of, Kyle, let's have a look at your stuff. OK, you, you've got some interesting things to uh, to share with us to make things more beautiful. I do. So I'm going to be uh, a little bit more nuts and bolts here. Um, okay. So as as Evan had kind of uh, alluded to, um, you cannot apply effects directly to these imported 3D models. So um, this is the uh, keyboard that um, Evan created. You can see it is in fact a three-dimensional object here. Ooh, ah. 
Um, and I cannot, in fact, apply any effect directly to it. Right, so and it's a very I... accurate keyboard. I think it's important that people it understand. Is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, so like if I try to grab the fill effect, it just won't let you do it. Um, so the, you know, the strategy here is, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Emma Corn had, uh, uh, I, I think, been working on some of this stuff earlier. So hopefully we can clear up some some questions. Yeah. Um, so the the way to do this is that you might, you know, use an adjustment layer. I'm going to use fill here just because it's a very, like, easy to see effect. Um, you know what? Let's use let's use tint because it's slightly less obnoxious. So I'm going to use tint on this adjustment layer, and let's grab um, a couple of these you know fabulous hotline colors here. Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, okay, but I don't want everything to be tinted. I just want the keyboard to be tinted. Well, there's a couple different ways that you can go about this. So one of them is that you can open up your track mat uh, column here. And you can use the models as a track mat. So in that case, I just make sure I turn this back on. And now I have that effect matted by the model. And it can do all of its um, movements and everything. And it will work exactly like you want it to, hmm. right? Um, the issue starts becoming when you have models that need to intersect each other or move in front of each other in Z space. So why don't we bring this mouse model in here and let's make this bigger here. Okay, very great. comfortable ergonomic mouse. Yep. Everybody says so. Yep. Okay, so we have this mouse here. I'm just gonna give it a little bit of uh, perspective. Let's make it kind of go in the other way here. And then let's move it um, down here. So obviously now we start having a little bit of a layering issue, right? And um, also like, well, I could have this adjustment layer and if it's above the mouse layer, now it's coloring both, but using the, you know, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And if I want to color both of these, like I really can't do two, I mean, I could do two adjustment layers, but that starts getting a little weird. Like I could make one up here and one for the mouse and turn that back on. It just, it starts becoming a lot, but also now these two cannot, interact properly in 3D space. Um, if I start, you know, uh, turning this whole thing, let's just quickly make a, a null object here and I'll parent these things to it so that we can, um, oh, I don't have my parenting open, that's why, parent. All right, so let's parent these to this null so that I can turn them both and you can see what happens once. Okay, yeah, so it's not working right because yeah, yeah. It's, it's a kind of freaky unreality uh... yeah because 2d layers break your 3d layering let's go ahead and just turn this off and poof looky here now they interact the way that they should so um and actually they're intersecting and we're all along which we couldn't see because of the adjustment layer <laughs> so this is when you start need to start using some workarounds and uh, admittedly right now um again i don't know you know how much this will evolve in the future but um you know some of these are a little easier to implement than others but um let's go ahead and take advantage of the main one here which is using um one of two effects called either they're both very scary <laughs> sounding <laughs> um either um uh compound arithmetic or calculations so i'm going to create a new solid comp size, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll use the calculations effect, which I am told is better, even though these are very similar things. And then, so this is one of those effects where you can choose a layer to be part of the effect. And this is the key. These are called compound effects. And just like you can reference these models as mats, you can also reference them with other effects. So here I'm going to reference this keyboard, okay? And then you have to turn up the second layer opacity. This is the thing I don't like about calculations is that mm. until you turn this up, it doesn't do anything. So it's not very intuitive. But effectively what this is doing, even if I turn off this keyboard and just solo this layer or whatever, um, calculations can pull another layer and then visualize that. 
Um, you can pull just color channels, just alpha. You know, you have some options here. And then you can do blending modes as well. So this is actually a very powerful compositing tool. But right now, it's also a great way to create a mask, or a, excuse me, a mat of one specific thing. So I'm going to turn off both the mouse and the keyboard. And then if I turn this on, let's say like keyboard, we'll call this faux keyboard, OK? Right, the fake, um, a projection yeah. of the keyboard. Um, and so what you could do is actually um, start uh, using this as your compositing tool. Um, trying to think, what am I, do I want just alpha maybe? What am I needing to do? Oh, probably want this to be alpha. Uh, I, now that I'm in the middle of this, I'm um, like, I'm having a, a foggy brain day as to mm. how to get rid of my white. Um, oh, I mean, true. I could absolutely just choose one of these blending modes, which isn't exactly what I wanted to do, but it, it'll get the job done here. Um, so I'm going to choose stencil alpha as my blending mode and get just that alpha mode from the keyboard. So you can see that this here, and let's call this then keyboard mat, because that's actually what it's doing. Sorry, this is getting a little in the weeds here. Um, the point that I really wanted to make is that I can duplicate this calculations effect and then point this to the mouse. And then if I want to, I could be combining this. Um, see this, what am I not doing? <laughs> um, the whole point is that you can combine these on this one layer. Mm. Uh, which I have done here, just not exactly in the way I meant to. Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm getting the whole layer. Some combination of these checkboxes is not clicking with my um, too cold brain today. <laughs> um, but the point is that you can use multiple instances of this calculations effect to mm. create a mat for both of these things. Okay, so let's make this adjustment layer and we'll call this the tint, right? So we mm. can get rid of that one down here and we can layer this wherever we need to. It can use that mat layer as the mat. And now it is applying that tint over both of them. But yep, there we go. And so now they can interact in the way that they need to in 3D space, but you've kind of compiled all of that um, mat information in one spot. Hmm. So that was kind of a long way to go to get there. <laughs> um, and, and yes, it is kind of a tricky thing right now. So that only comes up if you absolutely need to have things still be able to interact properly in 3D space um, and overlap each other at different points hmm. without, um, you know, the other option is that you could have multiple adjustment layers and split them and kind of layer them like this and just be very mindful about your timing when they split like right before you know it turns to the frame where they overlap or something but um you know you shouldn't need to do stuff like that that's true i'm learning from the chat that apparently it might be blue monday today now blue monday of course it's a it's a band no no it's a song it's a song by new order <laughs> by new order yep <laughs> But apparently it is, uh, what, the day furthest between holidays? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, much of North America, at least the middle of it, is quite blue right now um, with dangerous cold. So I think that, <laughs> that qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, hope nobody privatized your power grid. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so let me... Let me um, I, I know that that got a little funky. Uh, if sure. I can show a thing or two that is a little more straightforward here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, bring us back to reality. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I think, I think at least in its current iteration, a lot of what this system is intended for is to be able to add, you know, one or two 3D models into an otherwise 2D animation. Yeah. You know, you can put this, um, for example, here is a little um, animation that I made earlier today. 
uh, just slapping a couple of effects on top of that keyboard. Um, we're getting a very modern looking, um, you know, super high tech version of this keyboard, right? <laughs> and all that is, is just bringing that in, doing a little bit of rotation, and then one adjustment layer with our old friend CC Ball Action, mm. everyone's go-to effect to create pixels, right? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> There it is. And then, uh, you know, some extra glows and whatnot just to kind of give it that fun uh, VHS look and all that. Huh. But um, when you, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, texture? Where was I? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Where's anything, man? It's this place. <laughs> okay. One thing to remember is that these models can always be referenced by any effect that mm -hmm. allows you to select other layers as part of the effect. Right. Um, and that's where this can do some really interesting things. So I have this keyboard in here. I'm gonna go ahead and just get rid of all of this other stuff. So we have just the keyboard and then we have this texture layer. I pre-composed it just so that it's the same size as the rest of this comp, okay? Um, and you can ignore this tritone. That's just there so it looks nice. But you could use something like displacement map, okay? I'll just reset this real quick so that I can start fresh. I'm going to point that to the keyboard. Let's go ahead and turn this on. You won't really see too much right off the bat. I'm going to go ahead and set this to, you know, whatever channel you want. You could choose the alpha. You can choose a color channel. I'm going to choose luminance here just because that seems like it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'll set both the horizontal and vertical to that. And then you can start displacing some 2D layer with your 3D layer. And you're like, okay, well, that's pretty cool, I guess. I'm getting some predator um, vision in here. Yeah, yeah getting there. Um, but maybe you want to be able to see the original thing still. Well, you could, of course, just turn this on and you know lower the opacity if you want. But you'll notice you don't get blending modes for this, which is a bummer. Um, I would love to have blending modes because usually you don't just want to lower the opacity. You want to, um, you know, use a blending mode so that you can kind of get what you want out of it here. But I will point out that our old friend CC Composite, one of my favorite effects, because it allows you to layer a layer the pre-effects version of something back on top of the affected version of it. Mm. Okay. So I, I use this a lot to like layer the original version of a layer on top of itself after the effects, but it very recently got updated and now it has a layer selector in it, hmm. which um, I will point out actually could destroy the smoothness of some of um, your old presets. But um, if you point that at a 3D model, now you can layer this back over whatever else you've done with blending modes. So I can overlay or, you know, choose screen or whatever I want to get exactly the, the look that I'm after. And so that 3D model is in here. You can do all the movement with it and uh, whatever you need to, but you're actually kind of getting all the look from a 2D layer that's referencing it with effects. Mm. Um, okay, before I hand this back to you, how about I show that depth of field trick? Sure, do, do it. Okay. Um, so the reason that I like to use shape layers for my gradient, which I said a minute ago, um, check this out. Um, and I actually do this pretty much anytime I'm using white and black values of one layer to derive something else. I like to make it a shape layer and set it on top of the composition. Um, so as Evan was doing a minute ago, I'm using the camera lens blur so that I can get this um, tilt shift effect because legit depth of field does not exist for these 3D models in here currently. But in camera lens blur, you can reference another layer, which is what I'm doing here. And so if you take this, um, if you take your shape layer with a gradient on it and you put it at the top of the composition, you leave the eyeball on, but you set the opacity to zero, mm. okay? Now what you can do 
is select the stuff in that shape layer. And let me actually change this color so it's even clearer. You can just select any of the stuff in this shape layer and you can still manipulate those gradient handles. <laughs> yeah, on top of everything. So you get a little on-screen draggable control here that you can easily see and interact with. Um, but it's obviously not visible over your, your stuff. Whereas if you buried this at the bottom of your composition, um, you, you'd have to kind of go in and, and grab this every time. But um, I find this a little easier if you need to play with these and kind of dial in where the positioning is. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. All right, well, let's see what I got cooking up over here. Yeah, what do you have? Well, <laughs> who, who can really say? Um, okay, so... Oh, that's the button. So, you know, we, we've been talking about, like, doing stuff with, <laughs> like, trying to make things look better. What if we want to make things look a little worse? Uh, uh-huh. Yep. So, Approved. check this out. I have layered up over here. We've got the cute moon. This is a little cute moon. And put a black solid behind it. Now, that's putting the black solid back there is important because if there is nothing going on back there. Some effects can get a little weird when you apply them as adjustment layers. So for example, I'm going to drop over this a Gaussian blur, Gauss in the house blur. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to put a threshold over top of that. If we didn't have the black solid in behind, the alpha is still getting a little blurry. So I'll turn the, so it, it would start to look like this. And that's not what we want, right? We want, we want like hard edges like that. And I'm just going to grab a point light out in the space and you can just grab the point light and, and orbit it around and you can kind of pick up the topography and stuff of, of what's going on. And, you know, it's just turning into a kind of weird two tone kind of deal. So just something to think about, like things don't have to look like stuff. We can really just use, <laughs> we can use the interaction of geometry and lighting um, to make things that are simply visibly interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, though, is I don't know if we talked about it last week, the CC environment layer. Uh, we did touch on that a little bit, um, yeah. but it wouldn't hurt to kind of cover it again really quickly. Yeah. It's in my space project as well, but um, yeah. have at it. Yeah, let's 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 do more of that. So let's say, for example, let's <laughs> start this over. And actually, you know what? Let's make it let's make it fewer pixels so I don't have to worry about. Crunchy and while he's game. setting this up, this might be a good time. Um, you folks that are watching, please let us know if there's anything specific that you would like to know or want us to kind of help point out um, about what's currently possible or what isn't. Yeah, and if there's any, you know, knowledge that you would like us to remove from your mind, if you think you know <laughs> too much, uh, we might be able to do that uh, as well. <laughs> we're thinking we're thinking about adding those features. Um, so we could, right, we could drop down a solid, I'll just make it the comp size and we'll put that kind of in behind and we can put whatever back there. Like, let's say get out your bingo cards. It's fractal noise. Bark, 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 bark. Yeah. Right. A, a lovely thing. But of course, if we have a new, uh, let's get a new camera out in the space. Uh, let's go ahead and make this like a 28 millimeter. So things are getting a little bit extreme and weird. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to parent that to the null so that I can kind of, just orbit around, right? And just so that we know that I'm orbiting, I'm going to just duplicate a second moon. <laughs> Two moons. Mm -hmm. uh, if those of you are wondering, Crazy talk. yeah, this is how you can really make very compelling fantasy worlds is if you just put an extra moon in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, <laughs> something to know. Hey, just remember that for next week's uh, thing when we're talking about podcasts and stuff. <laughs> um, so we know... We have two things in the space. So now when I start to orbit, you get the idea that we're orbiting around something. We still don't have a sense of space or place because maybe we're orbiting around this. Maybe it's just rotating. Who even knows, right? Like we don't have enough context. And even if we push that off of the, off of the center, uh, we're, we're still not sure, right? And it's all down to what is the background void doing and the fractal noise is not going to cut it because it's not three-dimensional it's not doing stuff it's not doing anything it's yeah. doing nothing so don't worry uh the good people uh over there at adobe have cc environment 
uh, for us to think about. Thank you, Psychor. Uh, yeah, I was going to say technically the good people at Psychor. Yeah. Um, so we've got CC Environment copyright. Oh no, I, I thought I thought it would tell us when it was first created, but it doesn't. Uh, anyway. Yeah, but some of them do. But the thing it does is it will map an environment to the camera view. Now, there are various methods you can do that. Let's just go ahead. I'm going to make a new solid. Um, it could be referencing other things, but it's it's just better to kind of make another layer. Um, and I think generally, if we're going to think of something that's equi rectangular, let's just make it twice as wide as it yeah. is high. And I think for starters, let's just put a fractal noise over top of this. And let's just see what happens. Let's just, mm -hmm. let's just see what happens. All right. We don't need to look at it because we're going to reference it with this other thing. So we're going to make sure that we are looking at... Uh, let's name things. I'll just call this the environment. So we are looking at the environment layer and we want effects and mask. We want to kind of post post game that. And so if we come down here to the null and we go and give that a little rotation. Hey, hey, hey. It look, looks like we're inside of something. Uh, I'm going to rotate on a different axis so that we can start to look at the, uh, we're going to say heat death of the universe uh, over there. <laughs> we're staring into an infinite black void uh, because... Right, this is an equi rectangular. Uh, I don't know if that's actually whoa. <laughs> so the different ways of <laughs> not that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so spherical probe, um, vertical cross. These are just different methods of understanding what we've brought to the table here. Um, so you're gonna see totally different. So basically, that intersection point. I'm just trying to get us look at that intersection point. Yeah. Right, it's just kind of changed. If you gaze directly at it, Evan, you'll never be the same. That's true. When you stare long into the, into the intersecting folds, they stare long into you. Um, so I'm going to switch it back to spherical, right? And now we are looking at the seam. So the best way mm -hmm. to kind of deal with this type of thing is to produce an environment layer that itself is sort of a an infinite looping type of thing like if this is seamless, if you need to of course yeah if you never look at the void if you never look at those terrible places you don't need to be doing this type of thing i mean uh, it, you know i'll just kind of quickly opine on this it, that's one of those things where like it's good to figure out what you need the thing to do before you spend a bunch of time making it seamless because maybe all you have to do is you know unless you're doing a full 360 spin on this environment you're not going to see that seam yeah. Um, even if you do, you know, almost 360, you can probably hide that pretty easily. So don't waste your time making it seamless. Yeah. But, you know. You could, you know. You could. <laughs> Look, nobody's, no one's going to stop you. No one can stop you. <laughs> it's impossible. Uh, <laughs> hmm. We do have a question, but uh, finish up your, your stuff here. Oh, sure. Uh, so, I'm sure. Kyle, I'm going to hope that I'm remembering uh, this. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this life hack correctly you can never okay never never totally tell um but what i'm trying to do is basically use an offset right to yeah move the stuff and bloop and if we do this we go into that mask or where'd my mask <laughs> go Burp. like this oh no because it's going to change does it change what is being offset i don't know i don't know let's see if i can at least get one of the seams or 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 yeah, I mean, there are a couple different approaches to making things seamless, but taking the outside corners and making those mm. the inner corners um, is is one good one. So I see what you're after here. Ooh. <clears throat> right, I need... But yeah, sometimes the way masks interact, I, I think you might yes. be catching a render order issue. I am, here. yeah. I'm, I'm doing it bad. Anyway, <laughs> here's, here's what we're going to do. Because you could pre-compose this and make a thing, right? You yeah. just... We could just pre-compose it. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to, I'm going to make it blurry enough that it doesn't matter so much. There you go. Right. <laughs> and we're going to stop looking at the seams. But <laughs> you can also, if you really need to kind of hide your seams a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to put like a, put like say a gradient ramp on here and I'm going to make it radial. Um, and we're going to change this blending mode here into overlay so that 
what we're really doing is we're getting, um, right, we're getting just the intersecting areas of this. So those are the areas that are getting clouded. So the outside of the thing can be totally seamless because the color lines up, right? Anyway, that's just a thought to, to uh, generate these things. Other stuff that you can do, uh, we've done it previously, actually. Do, 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 do. Hold on, I got that P... I got that PSD around here somewhere, Kyle. Uh, well, I hunt that up. What's the question that's coming in? <laughs> uh, so we do have a question that honestly, I'm not sure I've explored yet. Um, when trying to convert a 2D layer with layer styles applied to a 3D layer, they don't apply when turning to 3D. I assume that uh, is in this new advanced render, but we'll need to poke that. Um, is there any trick to solve it? Uh, so, <laughs> do, 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 do. It depends on what the behavior is that we want them to have, right? Yeah. Like, if they're just meant to, if it's meant to be like a sprite that we're just making three-dimensional, then you would just pre-compose it and make the pre-comp 3D, right? Well, um, and that's, that's the thing. I, I think three um, pre-composing might be the trick here. Uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm going to set up a quick example comp um, to to explore this while you uh, finish up your your business there. Okay, my mm -hmm. business. All right, maybe I can use an HDR for this. Let's find out. Uh, -do -do. Turn that off. Because this thing I know at least loops across one of its axes. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. <laughs> Clunk like that. Ah, now we can observe the infinite vastness of space. Uh, which is great. So we can. Wow. So this still has because I didn't I didn't line it up vertically, but I did line it up horizontally, which I think was very, very <clears> clever <throat> of me. So we can orbit around like this. Mm -hmm. And if we, Kyle, if we never pitch up, we'll never know about my exactly. Terrible <laughs> we'll never, we'll <clears> that's my see, point. <laughs> we'll never see that terrible thing I did, um, which is exactly what we want to do. <laughs> Live your life a quarter mile at a time, etc. Um, but you can, in this case, I'm just going to, I'm going to make things nice and blurry and you can kind of see, you know, that repeating those edge pixels, you do start to see the seams there. So generate your seamless things, bring them in here, or we can, we can, if people are interested, we can explore doing that in a pre-comp, but, uh, let's jump back to Kyle's screen real quick here. Cause give me just a few seconds. Oopsie. Well, this is fine. Um, my after effects was being, uh, misbehaving a little bit. So yeah. I have. I started it over. I do have a, um, my project file has quite a few 3D models in it, and that might be a factor. Uh, <laughs> let me, I'm going to go ahead and set this back to the classic 3D engine here. Let's go ahead and close the other comps. Did you know that existed, by the way? <laughs> Any timeline, the little hamburger menu, close other timeline panels. Yeah. So if you have too many open, that's the trick. Um, let's just quickly... Make some text here, um, layer style. Let's uh, break that into two lines. Okay, so I'm going to quickly add some layer styles. And these are, of course, um, sort of imported from Photoshop. Um, they're kind of an odd thing in terms of, you know, the way that they interact is they only interact with one another in the way that they, um, in the render order. So like if you have mm -hmm. effects, on a layer and layer styles, you need to be very mindful of how those are applied because like if I put an effect on this and then use this drop shadow, that's gonna apply differently than if I use the effect drop shadow. Yeah. And so in most cases, you probably just want to use effects to replicate these, but there are some that uh, just don't work as well. Um, <laughs> and they have so, a last, right? Is that where it is? Yes, I, I, uh, I'm gonna say yes right mm -hmm. now. I mean, um, there's also a really weird thing of like, if you apply the, yeah, so you've got the gradient layer. Uh -huh. I right? chose this intentionally. Yeah. Um, the gradient overlay is one that I think confuses people a lot because, you know, when you've built stuff in Photoshop and you bring it over here, these make sense. But in animation, when boundaries can change, um, that's where stuff gets odd because, um, I think a lot of folks would want to apply this in a way where, you know, all of your text looks like this. But if you have two lines of text, for example, it's stretching that gradient over the whole shape. And then if you start animating this, 
you're changing the bounding box over time. And so it gets strange. Um, but let's go ahead and make this 3D. And you'll see in this case, in the classic 3D engine, it brings it over just fine. Um, I'm going to change this to the advanced 3D and see what happens. Uh, yeah. It looks like, yeah, it looks like it vanishes here, um, which I am not super shocked by because that may be one of the things that, um, let's take a look at that list. Uh, layer styles are just straight up disabled in the advanced 3D renderer. Mm. So um, if you're trying to do it there, what I would recommend, um, and if you look at some of my project files from our 3D episodes, you'll see me doing this a couple times over. Um, for something like this, uh, let's go ahead and do this the way that I, I would properly. Um, I'm going to take my text layer and like move it forward a little bit so it doesn't intersect. And then we'll um, animate the camera real quick. And so I know this is going to be really mind-blowing, but this is my animation, okay? Um, so what I would do if I really needed to keep this layer style is I would duplicate the camera and then pre-compose the camera and that layer style. And then in this comp is when I would change this to the advanced 3D. And that way you're still getting the look that you're after, um, but you kind of tucked that thing away. And sometimes you have to do this to kind of mix and match the 3D renders. Um, I will quickly point out in my space scene here, um, this is from last week's episode, I did this in a couple places, like my son, for example. Mm. I did not want that to be affected by the lights that were affecting the planets and such, because the sun is supposed to be the thing lighting everything, and I didn't want it to be getting shadows from, quote, itself. So it's actually tucked away in a pre-comp here without any lights or anything like that, so that it can just kind of exist, and then I can slap effects on top of it in my actual composite. So um, hopefully that's kind of an answer to the question. It's not uh, the most elegant solution because now you have this, you know, these camera keyframes in two places. So if I were building this for myself, it's something where I would kind of just deal with not being able to see this layer style until I know that my camera is fixed. Or you could start using expressions to tie these um, across compositions. Mm. But that can start getting a little messy or confusing and if you offset the time of this pre-comp at all like that starts um, introducing other variables so i understand that it's not the most ideal um you know scenario but sometimes it is what it is true <laughs> well, speaking of we've got another uh, non-ideal scenario um, i saw question. that what if it, what if it's an isometric 3d object and i've used i've used graphics to apply to the visible sides so the other sides would be blank Sort of workaround. I'm trying to think. Uh, let's see. It's a flat rectangle turned into a 3D object with the 3D effect. Oh, the 3D. Hmm. 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 Uh, okay. So I, I got a little bit of this through Instagram DMs earlier. Uh, okay. I, I th is this the thing that you had built in Illustrator? Ooh, if you build something in Illustrator, you can just export a gefulb or whatever. Right. Um, though, uh, and, and I mentioned this, um, things that you create... 3D objects that you're creating in Illustrator, if you then, you can then export them as GLTFs mm -hmm. uh, and import them here. I have found those to be considerably larger than a comparable thing built in an actual 3D app. Right. Um, so it's, it's workable, but it does seem like it's quite a bit heavier just because Illustrator isn't like optimizing that um, the same way that a 3D software would. Yeah. But it should it should bring out like if it's if it's textured and you're using it in the 3D space, it should come out at least looking as intended. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if there's something about um, uh, th there are instances where like the texture can kind of get applied to um, flipped normals is the <laughs> the term that 3D people would use. Uh, I don't know that an illustrator thing would run into that necessarily, but it does. because it doesn't you, seem like it's complex if, enough. No, if you, if you apply like some, some 
kind of unique bevels and stuff, you'll see you'll see some wacky stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you'll experience some strangeness. Um so yeah, it's a um it's an interesting trouble. I would almost kind of recommend like this is kind of where you kind of need to get into like a substance, right? That's where that's what substance is yeah, for. Maybe. Is, is painting the stuff on the faces that you want it to be on, basically. I I, I will say um you, you know, as you are longtime friend of the show, um, I, I happily invite you to send this mm. project file to me or us, uh, and I will be happy to sort of explore and try to figure out what the what the issue is here. Yeah, um, it, it's a little hard to kind of, uh, you know, just just from some text, it's a little hard to troubleshoot sometimes. That's true. On something that has a lot of potential variables there. You know what? Any, anyone send us some stuff. Yes, I exactly. I can't promise we'll do something with it, but just <laughs> send it to us because we uh, we always need new questions. We always need new problems uh, to solve. So whatever's whatever's ailing you, bring it to us. Be it uh, generally After Effects stuff is what you should bring to us uh, in yep. order to solve. But if there's sort of a complex project that you're working on, you're trying to figure out how it goes, whether you're in the planning stages or whatever, Bring bring us your trubs. We'll try to try to help you out as best we can. Kyle, I think we've kind of come to the end of the end of the program here. I, guess I mean, kind of, kind of. It's it's a good time for us though to uh, to kind of plug uh, the stuff that we're doing this month. Um, so next week we are back next week. Um, apparently we're, we've been uh, getting hosted on the main Adobe Live feed, so that's that's something good. that's going on today. But we'll be back on that Adobe Live feed next week. We're going to be talking about podcast promos some primo podcast promos um so if you have a podcast if you have a friend with a podcast uh if you have a non-problematic uncle with a podcast then <laughs> you can you know tell them how to make good promos now obviously there are a lot of like websites and stuff that do automatic ones we're going to be showing you how to kind of let's, let's kind of get that to the next level let's try to make things mm -hmm. that stand yeah. out and be interesting um so that's what we're going to be bringing to you um, and then I'm trying to think the, I think the week after that, we are deciding who wins some beautiful reboot DVD. That is true. And a t-shirt. <laughs> and a t-shirt. A beautiful t-shirt. <laughs> at least one other thing. Yeah, exactly. And so if you want to get your hands on this, this seminal, uh, 3, 3D cartoon from Canada, this, this mid nineties 3D cartoon, uh, <laughs> launched a thousand ships, Coco Melon, uh, crawls because reboot walked. Uh, you, know, you know, the main thing that we want you to get our hands on are the amazing 3D models that right. Evan created. He he handcrafted these for you. That cute little moon you saw, this very accurate keyboard, several other 3D objects, um, all the little keyframes. He made those for you so that you can make neat stuff. Yeah. Um, and then we can uh, look at it as uh as content <laughs> mm, my favorite mm. and so that is uh the 26th we want to we want to see those mm -hmm. uh put it up on instagram tag at ec abrams tag at kylosaurus rex tag adobe live um and uh, hashtag hashtag motion design hotline if you do some of those things we'll see them and we'll be able to look at it on the show uh that's the idea and we will we will try our best to utilize the postal system wherever you are in the world to send, <laughs> send you these objects. Yeah, there probably um, are some exceptions that we can't work sure. around, but yeah, we'll see. If, if you're watching this from the Antarctic Research Base, I don't know if we can get these things to you. You'll probably I assume be... it's doable. It'll just take a long time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, time and tide permitting, we'll do that. Yeah. But but next week, we're talking about podcast stuff. So, you know, if you have friends with a podcast, tell them to tune in uh, or hoard that knowledge to yourself and then uh, ho hold it over them. <laughs> so... <laughs> Gatekeep all of it. Yeah, exactly. Think what you do with the knowledge is up to you. We provide it. We provide Gatekeep it. Gatekeep the knowledge that you get from this free show. Yes. <laughs> What else is there to do in our days? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna take off before we become too bleak. Like I say, I'm Evan Abrams <laughs> at EC Abrams uh, on the internet. Kyle Hamrick, thanks for being with me at Kylosaurus Rex. Um, and yeah, um, so next time, stay creative, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all around the internet. I don't know anything else to uh, to say yeah. there, Kyle. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for watching. Um, this show doesn't happen without you sending us questions and. I guess it exists without you watching, but...
<laughs> we'll, we'll put it into the void as long as yeah. we're having fun. All right. <laughs> All right. Bye for now, everybody.